Hey, welcome to Grace Church Online. My name is Matt, and I'm really glad that you are here, whether this is your first time watching or you're part of our online community every week. At Grace Church this year, our focus is to help you become more spiritually healthy. And today, we're continuing to talk about the spiritual discipline of fasting. Now, for many of us, we didn't even know that fasting was a spiritual discipline, right? We think about prayer, reading our Bible, attending church as spiritual disciplines, but fasting just seems like something that's really hard to do on a regular basis. Often it's because we don't see the benefits of fasting if we think it's just about staying away from food or logging off of social media for a while. But that's because it's not just about the habit, but about the mindset that you have while you do it. So what is that mindset? And how can we keep it so that fasting can become a beneficial habit in our life? Here to talk about that is Pastor Brandon. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Brandon. I'm the pastor of Grace Church in West Bridgewater. And before we get into our teaching, I wanna do something a little different. I, 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 if you're watching this right now, the odds are you've got something else on your mind, something else going on in your life. Maybe it's something in your marriage, maybe it's financial things, maybe it's stress from work, or maybe your kids are running around your house right now just driving you nuts. And so before we get into our teaching, I, I wanna do something different because I believe that God wants to speak to you today through his word. I, I believe that God wants to, to speak into your heart, speak into your life. And so we need to position our hearts to hear from him. And so before we get into our teaching, I, I wanna pause for the next 20 seconds and I just wanna be quiet. So I want you to literally, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take some deep breaths. I want you to ask God to speak to you today. And let's just be quiet for the next 20 seconds as we begin and, and get ready to hear from God. Wherever you're at today, in your living room, outside or at work, wherever you're watching this, um, God speak to us today. We invite you into our lives, into all the mess, into all the chaos. We want to hear from you. We wanna meet you today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in the middle of a series called Nestuo, Nestuo, and that's the Greek word that means to fast. And over the past couple weeks, we've been looking at fasting and how we can better practice it in our lives. In our first week, we worked through what even is fasting? What does it mean to fast? And we looked at Matthew chapter six, where Jesus gives us a description of what fasting is. Is. He even says, when you fast, and then he gives us like a step-by-step -step guide on what fasting should look like in our lives. And then last week, we got to hear from Pastor, Pastor Sean, um, and, and Pastor Sean showed us what fasting looked like in the early church and how we, we learn what, that our capacity can increase when we spend time fasting. Our spiritual capacity increases. And maybe you remember the balloon example. And if you don't, I would encourage you, go back to last week's teaching. You can find it at thatsgrace.org slash messages after this and check it out because it was a phenomenal example of what happens in our spiritual lives when we commit to fasting. Now here we are on week three of this series. And maybe the first week when we started talking about fasting, you were amped up. You're, you're saying, I'm gonna fast every single day, I'm gonna fast every single meal, and the whole week you're just all in on fasting. And then week two kind of rolled around and now all of a sudden the fun of fasting has worn off a little bit. The, the spiritual high of fasting has gone away a little bit. And now you're, you're committed to fasting from brunch on a Sunday, or, or you're committed to fasting to only one time at Chick-fil-A a week. Uh, the fun is kind of worn off, and now here we are at week three. And if you're being honest, uh, fasting and even the idea of fasting has kind of become pretty stale. And I wanna kind of start this teaching off with an example. And I just, I need you to bear with me. I need you to nerd out with me for a second because when I was growing up, we had a video game console called a Sega 
Genesis, okay? That was my video game console of choice. And my favorite games to play on the Sega Genesis were Sonic the Hedgehog. I had every game, every Sonic the Hedgehog game ever made, but my favorite one was Sonic the Hedgehog 2 because they introduced a character that had two tails, was a fox, and his name was Tails. And I played that game every day. There was not an ounce of dust on that game because every day I was touching, I was putting it into the system, you know, it was the old cartridge, so you had to kind of blow on it, you know, to get the dust out, you'd put it in the system. I played that game every single day. But what happened over time was that game, I started to get a little bored. Sonic the Hedgehog 2, even though it was my favorite game ever, it became stale until Sonic and Knuckles came out. Now, Sonic and Knuckles was a video game that introduced another character named Knuckles, a red hedgehog. But that game, you could take, it had a slot on the top where you could stack another cartridge on top and it would introduce Knuckles into whatever game you stacked on top. It was like this mind blowing technology. And so I remember I took Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and I stacked it on Sonic and Knuckles and all of a sudden Knuckles was in Sonic the Hedgehog 2. And all of a sudden this game that had been stale, this game that I'd played every day, but it becomes stale in my life was reinvigorated. I was recharged. I was excited to play Sonic the Hedgehog 2, it revitalized my passion for Sonic and the gang. And today I want to look at a story in the Old Testament where the people's fasting and spiritual lives had become stale. And the lessons that we can learn from it to keep fasting fresh and exciting in our lives, just like the game Sonic and Knuckles did for me. And so I want you to grab your Bibles, grab your Bibles, and open up to Zechariah chapter Seven. Now, Zechariah is a prophet in what's called the Old Testament. And this is, this is right in the middle of your Bible. And Zechariah uh, was a prophet and prophets communicated a word from God to people. So prophets were people that heard from God and then they would communicate that to the people of Israel. And so Zechariah is speaking to the people of Israel after they're freed from 70 years of captivity by the Babylonians. And during those 70 years, the people of Israel would fast in the month of August to remember the destruction of Jerusalem, to remember the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And so now when we we open this chapter, the Israelites are just returning. They've just been released from exile and captivity by the Babylonians. And they're returning to Jerusalem and they're starting to rebuild their lives and rebuild the temple. And they wonder, do we still need to fast? Is this something we still need to do? We were doing it every August, but do we still need to do this? And so I want to open up Zechariah chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. I want to start there. It says this, On December 7th of the fourth year of King Darius's reign, another message came to Zechariah from the Lord. The people of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regemelech along with their attendants to seek the Lord's favor. They were to ask this question of the prophets and the priests at the temple of the Lord of heaven's armies. Should we continue to mourn? This is their question, right? This is when they're wondering, should we keep fasting? Should we continue to mourn and fast each summer on the anniversary of the temple's destruction as we have done for so many years? Seems pretty simple enough, right? The Israelites are like, do we really need to keep doing this? It seems pointless to to fast now, but... What we're about to learn through God's response to them, through speaking to Zechariah, is that he wants to speak to their hearts. That while they were fasting, it wasn't necessarily for God that they were fasting. And so we're going to read that in verses 4 to 6. It says this, The Lord of heaven's army sent me this reply. This is Zechariah. Sent Zechariah this message in reply. Verse 5, Say to all your people and your priests, During these 70 years of exile, when you fasted and mourned in summer and in early autumn, was it really for me that you were fasting? Was it really for me that you were fasting? And even now in your holy festivals, aren't you eating and drinking just to please yourselves? See, to keep our fasts from becoming stale, 
We, we have to check the posture of our hearts. And this leads us to the first lesson that we learned from the Israelites and their stale fast. And that is fasting should glorify God. Every time we fast, it should glorify God. See, God is speaking to the Israelites' hearts in verses 4 through 6 saying, this fasting that you were doing it, yes, you did it every August. That's great. But it wasn't even for me. You weren't fasting for me. You weren't fasting to glorify me. In fact, it's not a tool to get what you want. Fasting doesn't give you power over God. And it's not about impressing those around you with how spiritual you are. That's not why we fast. And Jesus actually speaks to this kind of heart, which is the heart of a Pharisee, a religious leader. And Jesus made a living calling out the religious leaders and their motives in what they were doing. And in Matthew chapter 23, verse five, Jesus says this about the religious leaders' hearts. He says this, everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside. And they wear robes with extra long tassels. See, Jesus was speaking to their heart condition, saying, yeah, they look spiritual, but they're dead inside. They're not doing any of this to glorify God. See, fasting is not meant to show how strong you are. It's meant to remind you how weak you are and how much you need God in your life. It brings us back to this posture where we realize truly how desperate we are for God to intervene in our lives. And and it leaves us in a place where all we can do is glorify him and worship him and praise him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31, it's written by a guy named Paul. And Paul is speaking to this heart that we have, this this heart that we are supposed to develop as we start following Jesus and and for our entire lives as we follow Jesus. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Of God. Now, I think I've heard this verse used many times at church or in sermons or in teachings. And I think we apply this to all sorts of spiritual things, right? We apply it to to praying. Make sure you pray for the glory of God. Everything that you pray for, do it all for the glory of God. Make sure you show up on Sunday or watch online for the glory of God. Make sure you read your Bible for the glory of God or make sure you watch what you say to people for the glory of God. But we leave out the first part of this verse. And Paul says, whatever you eat or drink... Paul is telling us that even what we physically consume, we can use that to glorify God. Or even what we say no to physically consuming, we can use that to glorify God. Remember, biblical fasting, as defined in week one of this series, we talked about how fasting biblically is restricting what our body wants and craves and desires, and instead seeking what our spiritual lives want, crave, and desire, which is more time with our Father in heaven. And some of you maybe during this fast, you found that all you can think of is the food that you want. Like on Wednesdays, you've committed to Wednesday breakfast, you're fasting from it. When we're, when breakfast rolls around, all you can think of is that cereal or the eggs or the juice or the smoothie or, or that Starbucks that you crave or that Dunkin' Donuts croissant, sausage, egg, and cheese on a croissant. That's my go-to, by the way. And if you're like me, you've never wanted a Cliff Bar so badly in your life. And it's it's in those moments when your body is craving food that you're learning discipline, that you're learning to say no to what your body wants and say yes to praising God, to glorifying him, to seeking him, thanking him for another day of life, thanking him that he saved you, that he rescued you in all of your mess, thanking him for your kids, thanking him and praising him that he has provided for you in so many ways. And while this might seem small, While those moments might seem fleeting, what you are learning is discipline and self-control. You're learning self-control to glorify God even when it's hard, even when you're being tempted with something 
else. You're learning to say no to what your flesh wants and instead glorify God. And I want to expand this even beyond food, even beyond a fast from food, because as we learn this discipline, as we learn this self-control, it, it goes beyond just food. This can lead you to, to say no when it comes to lust. This can lead to you saying no when it comes to just one more drink. This can lead you to say no when it comes to, I just need one more taste. I need to share a little more gossip. This, this discipline, this self-control will start to trickle out into so many other areas in your life. And instead of wanting one more taste or one more drink, you want just a little bit of God, a little bit more of God. You want to glorify God more in those moments. And see, the Israelites had forgotten in the book of Zechariah that this is what it's all about. See, for them, fasting, it had just become another thing that they have to do. I have to fast. I have to do this not something they were invited into to glorify God. And when we remember that fasting is about glorifying God, it leads us to the next lesson that we learn in Zechariah, and that's this. Fasting should lead us to obedience. Fasting should lead to obedience. In Zechariah, I want to go back to Zechariah chapter 7. So open up your Bibles again or go back to Zechariah chapter 7, verses 8 to 10. This is what happens. This is what it says. Then this message came to Zechariah from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Now, this is what God wants the Israelites to do when they fast. This is what it should look like. He says this, judge fairly and show mercy and kindness to one another. Do not oppress widows or orphans or foreigners and the poor and do not scheme against each other. See, see, the Israelites' stale fasting had led them to forget that there is action that should take place and be involved in our fasting. Because their fasting had just become some ritual, something they have to do, and not something that was playing an active role in them seeking to glorify God through their fasting, there was no obedience that came out of their fasting. There was no obedience involved in their fasting. But as followers of Jesus, if you have committed and surrendered your life to follow Jesus during our time of fasting, not only should we be seeking to glorify God, we should be seeking his will over ours. And to do that, it requires obedience and surrender. There's a great revivalist from the 40s and 50s. His name was Franklin Hall. Franklin Hall. And he wrote a book called Atomic Power with God Through Prayer and Fasting. And in this book, he talks about four appetites that every human being has. There's four appetites that every human being has. And the first one is spiritual hunger. Every human being, on some level, there is a spiritual hunger that they have. And then the next appetite is physical hunger. Every human being needs food, needs physical nourishment. And then the third hunger is lust, the hunger of lust that... Every human being has a desire for a little bit of instant gratification or there's deep desires within every human that they're looking to satisfy. And then the fourth appetite, the fourth hunger, is the hunger of greed. Every human being, myself included, at some level, we want more. We want more material things. We want the newest iPhone. We want the best car. We want the biggest house. We want a lake house. We want all of these different things. We always need more. And what Franklin writes about in his book, he talks about how fasting quenches our hunger for lust and our hunger for food and our hunger for greed. But what it doesn't do is it in it doesn't quench our hunger for spiritual things. In fact, it gives us a deeper hunger for those things. It increases our spiritual appetite. He says this in the book. He says, it was through the yielding to temptation that Adam and Eve gave way to satisfying their appetite for all of these hungers. The temptation of Jesus Christ, which we're going to talk about in just a second, the temptation of Jesus Christ was similar to that of Adam and Eve's temptation. And it was these same appetites that Satan chose to tempt Jesus with. Now, the temptation that he's referring to takes place in Matthew chapter 4. 
And Jesus has been in this solitary place praying and fasting from food for 40 days. And it's, it's, it's at the end of this fast that all of the sudden the devil shows up and comes to him and he tries to tempt Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, it says this. During that time, so at the end of the fast, during the 40 days, at the end of that, during that time, the devil came and said to him, him being Jesus, if you are the son of God, tell those stones to become loaves of bread. I, I mean, imagine this temptation. Jesus has not eaten in 40 days. So at this moment, not only is Satan tempting him to satisfy his physical hunger, like he's tempting him with lust as well. He's saying, listen, you know you want it. You know you can have it right now. Just do it. And then on top top of that, he's tempting him with greed. He's he's saying, you have the power to have more here. You just use the power that you have to have more, to have some bread in this moment. But what we learn, what we learn from Jesus in his response is that during these 40 days of fasting, he's been glorifying God and he has spent that time working on his spiritual appetite because listen to how Jesus responds in verse four. But Jesus told him, no. Jesus told him no, and it even adds, I love this, the exclamation point in there, like stamp of approval, no, heck no, Satan. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. His fasting, Jesus' fasting for 40 days has led him to a place of increased obedience and trust that everything he needs comes from God. A little later um, in, the, in the New Testament, John, who's one of Jesus' closest friends, he writes about something similar in, in the book of 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And John says this, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions right? These are the appetites that we have as human beings. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But listen to this. Here's the caveat. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. See, we all have these physical cravings and and pangs of hunger that we are fighting against every single day. And and fasting actually heightens our senses and allows us to see just how much these four appetites rule our lives. Fasting increases our senses and now all of a sudden we're seeing just how much maybe lust or greed or, or physical hunger dominates our thinking. And it's in this heightened state of awareness that we begin to start, we start to hear more clearly what it may be that God is calling us to do in obedience. Things that he's asking us to give up, things that he's asking us to pray about, direction he's looking to give us in our lives. All of a sudden we start to hear these things as our spiritual appetite increases and our appetite for physical food and lust and greed decreases. We start to hear more from God and that's because Fasting should lead to sensitivity in the spirit. Fasting should lead to sensitivity in the spirit. Listen to this in Zechariah chapter 7, verses 11 to 14. This wraps up this story in Zechariah chapter 7. And what I want, what I want to show in this is what not to do. What the Israelites did is not what we want to do in verses 7 or verse 11 all the way to 14. Your ancestors refused to listen to this message. So the message that God has been giving through Zechariah, listen, your ancestors, they refused to hear this. I love what, what he says here. They stubbornly turned away and put their fingers in their ears to keep from hearing. They made their hearts as hard as stone so they could not hear the instructions or the messages that the Lord of heaven's armies had sent them by his spirit through the earlier prophets. That is why the Lord of heaven's armies was so angry with them. Verse 13, since they refused to listen when I called to them. This is so important. Since they refused to listen when I called to them, I would not listen when they called to me. 
says the Lord of heaven's armies. As with a whirlwind, I scattered them among the distant nations where they lived as strangers. Their land became so desolate that no one even traveled through it. They turned their pleasant land into a desert. So to keep fasting fresh in our lives, we've learned a few things from the Israelites' mistakes. The first is that fasting should always be done with the intent to glorify God. Every single time we fast, it should be done to glorify God. The second is that our fasting should lead us to obey what God says. And now we learn from the Israelites that it should also lead us to be more sensitive to what the Spirit is saying to us. See, for the Israelites, instead of fasting to grow closer to God, they fasted because their temple had been destroyed. And they fasted because they were under Babylonian control. They fasted because they wanted something other than God. And God speaks to this in verse 13. Don't forget, he says, since they refused to listen to me, I wasn't interested in listening to their fake fasts, their stale fast, their fast that meant nothing. They wanted the temple to be rebuilt. Meanwhile, God wanted their relationship to be rebuilt. And because God wanted something for them that they didn't want, they chose to ignore God instead. God, that sounds great, but we're not really interested in what you want in our lives. We want our temple rebuilt. We want to be released from Babylonian captivity. And if that's not what you want for us, I'm not interested in hearing what you want. Zechariah verse 11, chapter seven, he says, they stubbornly turned away and put their fingers in their ears to keep from hearing. The Israelites were children. But how often do we do this too? How often do you have a prompting from the Holy Spirit in your heart? The Holy Spirit says, hey, I want you to go talk to your neighbor, invite them to church, or hey, this is a really good opportunity at work for you to share a little bit about your faith and what you believe and who Jesus is. And we stubbornly, we stick our fingers in our ears and we say, no, 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 that can't be right. That's not what I want. See, when we fast, the ultimate goal is not that God gives us something on the other side. Fasting had become stale and a burden to the Israelites. It was something they had to do. And at the beginning of this series, maybe you remember we said this, fasting without prayer and seeking God, it's just a diet. Prayer and quietly listening to the Holy Spirit during our time of fasting, it unplugs our ears and it softens our hearts to hear what the Holy Spirit may be trying to say that we were just too distracted to hear before. I want you to just imagine this right now. If Jesus stepped into the room that you're in right now, physically, Jesus walked into the room that you're into that you're in right now, how aware of him would you be? You'd be fixated on every blink, every twitch. You'd write down every word. You'd have a million questions to ask him. Well, Jesus tells us in in the gospel of John chapter 14, verses 25 to 27, listen to what Jesus tells us. He tells us that he's always with us. He says, I'm telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I mean, what a promise. Why do we forget the fact that when we choose to follow Jesus, when we go all in on Jesus, the Holy Spirit makes his dwelling within us. And if you've put your faith in Jesus and chosen to follow him, the Holy Spirit now lives inside of you and is ready to transform you to look more like Jesus, to teach you what Jesus taught, to show you how Jesus lived. The Holy Spirit is always ready to speak to us. We just have to be sensitive to hear him. And as we begin to be sensitive to hear the spirit in our lives, we, it, he begins to teach us how to be obedient in our everyday life. But to become sensitive to hear his voice, it takes time spent with him. And so to close today, I want to I challenge you with a few ways that you can practically apply this to your life. And, and the first one is, is, is pretty simple. It's what this whole series has been about. Just start fasting. Start fasting. Maybe it's one day a week. One day a week. Every Wednesday, you're committed to not eating breakfast, lunch, or dinner. 
You will instead take those breakfast, lunch, and dinner time slots and you will devote them to prayer and seeking after God and just being quiet and listening. Maybe you fast from two meals a, a day or maybe you fast every Wednesday and Friday or, or breakfast every day of the week. Create space in your life to increase your spiritual appetite. The second thing you can do is maybe you need to re-engage in fasting. Maybe you're like the Israelites and and honestly, it's become something you have to do. It's become stale. It's like Sonic the Hedgehog 2. It's just, you've done it so many times, now it's just boring. And you maybe that's because you've lost focus on what it's all about. And so maybe this week, I'm going to challenge you, just re-engage in fasting this week and practice the three things that we talked about today. Glorify God, obey what he says, and listen and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And maybe what that's going to require is you don't do all the talking. Instead of telling God all of these different things, maybe you take 30 minutes while you're fasting and you just listen. You turn off your phone, put everything away. You find a, get into a closet in your bedroom if you need to, and you just be quiet and listen. Now, lastly, we learned a, a few lessons today that I think can be applied even beyond just fasting in our lives. When it comes to glorifying God, what, what is an area of your life that has grown stale? A, a spiritual area of your life where, where glorifying God, it's more of just an af- afterthought. Maybe it's reading your Bible. Maybe it's spending time in prayer. Maybe, maybe if you're being honest, it's attending Grace Church. It's watching online. It's just become stale for you. Think of some ways that that instead of allowing it to become stale, you are looking to glorify God through those times. Glorify God in everything that you eat, drink, say, and do. The second thing is maybe you need to obey God a little more. What's one area of your life or, or your spiritual walk where you can practice more radical obedience during this fast? Maybe for you, it's God. God's asking you to seek reconciliation with a friend or a coworker or a family member. Or maybe God is asking you to increase your giving. Or maybe God is asking you to start serving at your local church, at, at Grace Church, or, or in your community. Maybe God's asking you to get out and serve in your community. Wherever it might be, be obedient. And then the last thing is be sensitive to the spirit. If you're anything like me, if you can't tell, I like to talk. In fact, I love talking. And sometimes I talk a lot and that leads me to rarely listen, especially when it comes to God. And so this week, I want to challenge you to create more space in your life, to be sensitive to what the spirit is saying. I want to challenge you. Take 30 minutes each and every day and just listen. Don't talk. Turn off your phone. Turn off the TV. Don't turn on worship music. Go into a closet if you have to and just listen to what the Holy Spirit may want to say to you. Let's pray together. God, there are, I think, times in our life where we have a tendency to be like the Israelites. God, to allow um, fasting or, or other spiritual disciplines or, or or even our walk with you, we allow it to become stale because we forget what it's all about. And so God, today I'm asking, I'm asking that you would increase our spiritual appetite, that you would give us a renewed hunger for your word. God, that you would unplug our ears to hear from you. God, that when you when you show us something, God, when you show us a direction, when you put a prompting on our heart, that we would be obedient to do it. God, I pray as we uh, wrap up this series next week, God, as we continue to talk about fasting, that this would not be something that we just do for a month. This would not be something that we just do for 21 days or two days, and, and then we forget about it. And we don't ever talk about it again. And we don't ever practice it. But God, this would become a discipline, a habit in our lives that we practice every single week, the same way we do with prayer, the same way we do with scripture reading, the same way we do with attending or watching, attending church or watching church online, God, that you would help this to become a habit in our lives so our spiritual appetite increases. God, we thank you for the gift of your word and the Bible. 
that it is sharper and it's than any other sword. It's living and it's active and it always speaks directly to our heart. We love you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I really love what Pastor Brandon said about taking time to just slow down and just be with God. You know, our culture tells us that we need to be busy, busy so that we can make more, experience more, and become more. But maybe what we really need is to slow down and to listen to God's promptings in our hearts. And maybe that's been the most difficult part of fasting for you. Maybe it's been easy to say no to certain foods, food at certain times, to log off of your social media or to turn off your TV. Maybe the hardest part has actually been quieting yourself down and giving God that time. So today, before we end, I wanna give you just a few minutes where you can do that. It's what we here call our check-in, and it's an opportunity for you to step back, to evaluate your spiritual growth, and then share that with us. This is one of the best ways that we here at Grace can get a snapshot of where you're at and where you're wanting to grow so that we can help you. So in another tab, another window, or maybe even after this video ends, you can go to thatsgrace.org slash check-in and just take two or three minutes to answer the questions and just reflect. And while you're doing that, we've got some music coming up right now that'll help give you the chance to slow down your pace and give God some space. my surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay it down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender and I will make room for you to do whatever you Whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to.
chasing now This is my surrender 